Okay, so we're recording. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started this morning. So these are the um, updates that we've had since the last time we have gotten together back in, was that uh, beginning of September, I believe. So this is anything from after that till now. So we'd just be going over the major ones. Um, some of them I didn't include would be just the ones that were behind the scenes that um, that you guys would not even notice. So, um, but these are the major ones that we want to just let you know. So the first one, um, the release was on 621. And that was back in, um, well, I included June actually, sorry. I don't know if I went back that far. Huh. Yes, I thought. Um, so I, I will just go ahead. Uh, the code that checks the accounts validations um, when, when you're adding a payroll distribution on the position pay, um, it wasn't giving you who the error was. So now um, this is um, was set up and now it will be on the payroll report. And that is 100% amount to charge must be to store the pay accounts for the employee and actually gives you the employee name in the position. Um, the import from classic import um, health insurance adjustment, this was added. Um, the classic 01 federal record, um, that is on the health record. That's where the classic and now in redesign, now we have the health reimbursement for employee is under the adjustment. So when you go to the adjustments, you'll now see the health reimbursement for that for the employees. On the on Juror issue 5319, um, the users would like the ACH submission to default to the employee social security um, into employee social security will not be included. So now when they go to the ACH submission under reports, they're going to see that this automatically now goes to employee social security will not be included. And this has been updated. Also on 5294, benefit accrual for active compensation validation. Um, the accrual and reset personal leave options um, will no longer require the accrual date to be inclusive of the compensation start and stop dates. So the employees will be on the report updated um, if the employee is eligible for that leave type for the leave type selected. So the employees will be on the report updated if the employee is eligible for that leave type regardless if that employee's compensation is active or non-active. So that has been updated. <clears throat> For 5320, the pay report, um, employee last name and employee ID sort options are not correctly labeled. So that was, go that was corrected on that one. So when running the pay report, the sort by names were changed for the employee ID and the employee last name and the employee first name. And then the employee ID is called employee number now. And then the employee last name, employee first name is called just employee name. So they just combine those two. And again, the employee name is always gonna be sorted by last, first and middle. So that is on the pay report. For 5290, the audit report timestamp column, um, this was requested that this include the date and the time before it was showing just the date. So now the um, districts can see exactly what time it was ran with that date. <clears throat> um, the users would like to sort the payroll report by pay group. Um, in classic, this was allowed by sorting by pay report by pay group on the pay report by pay group. Um, so the classic always used the pay group of the lowest position number first, and they wanted that to be in redesign. So now in redesign pay group sort is added to the pay report and it's pay group employee name and pay group employee number. And um, just a reminder when you're going through that sort, it's way, I believe way at the bottom of that sort now. So if you weren't, um, weren't sure that this was added, it is, it's just way at the bottom of that. So you just kind of have to scroll down with your mouse and you'll see that. <clears throat> the 4785, the users would like the EMS reporting to be easier to maintain. Um, so they did a lot of different, and we added this in the documentation also under the EMIS, under the core. So now you will see, um, what if an archive employee 
how that how the SIF data collector is um, looking at that and how it's being reported. And so now we added how compensations are included in the report. So, so now if the compensation start and stop dates are within the current fiscal year, it will be included. And then if the compensation start and stop dates are within the prior fiscal year and the position separation date is in the prior fiscal year and has a separation reason, it will be included in the collection. And I also added employee marked as report to EMIS. So if the employee is marked as reportable to EMIS, then the employee will be included when they, when they collect the employee CI information. If the position's compensations are collected separately, so um, if the position compensation is marked as not reportable, then it would not be included in the position collection. So again, if you have questions on how is it collecting, what is it looking at, um, sorry, cat. Um, the archive employees, this will be under the EMIS entry. So, and also there's a warning that was added, employee report to EMIS is false. So the employee name has compensations with report to EMIS set to true. So there's also that there was a warning added on that when they run that collection or the EMIS reports. For the 4785, what also was added on that juror issue is a new rule under systems. So if you go to the um, under systems new rule, you're gonna see rule to warn user when employee reports to EMIS is false, but the compensations exist with report to EMIS is set to true. Um, this was asked to be um, added. So now a district or ITC can go to this um, system and they can make this either true or false, they can enable it or disable it. But I had another screenshot. So now they will get rule to warn user when employees report to EMIS is false, but compensation exists. So they can either have this set up so they can get this warning, or if they don't, they can just, um, they can switch it to false. But I believe it is set to true um, when we did the juror issue update um, on the release. So again, um, if you wanna go ahead and look at that or find out what your districts, um, prefer. Uh, September 11th, um, the 5362, the printing Im imported payments generates exception. Um, now, now can print payroll payments for an employee that was not paid in redesign. And that was on the 5362. Um, we were having issues with that, with uh, anything that was being imported um, from classic um, and but, the, but if the employee was not paid yet in redesign, it, for some reason we could not print those payroll payments. And now um, that is fixed. On 622, also 5353, changed the combined LPA LPA description to last pay. We had a request that they didn't like the LPA LPA, they'd rather have the last pay for the district. So we went ahead. And if you go into the system configuration, payment printing configuration, make sure a combined accrued and regular wages is true. Um, you go ahead and um, click on that. So now once you have that under the payment printing configuration, what that does then, it will combine when, when the last pay of the employer or last pay for the accrual, um, it will now show last pay on the stub. So I won't show LPE or LPA anymore. So that has been changed and it just says last pay. For the 4711 update notification service for the FTB delivery to handle ASCII 2. So um, I also included the documentation on that. So if you want to go ahead and check that out, I included that on here. And I also have it on our um, wiki page for if you want, um, go ahead and download this PowerPoint too. Um, enter in the send output to email address or it can be sent to a directory. So now this has been set up. So the reports can be sent to a directory if you choose so. Um, you would choose to type in the send output file. So example, if you wanted to send it to the NOACA4 directory, you'll go ahead and type in your FTB with your um, NOACA name and then your user password for the NOACA4. 
And then this will send it as the binary format. So FTP will be binary. The FTPA will be your ASCII 2 format. And then the SFTP will be as a secure file. So again, if you want to have more questions of that, um, we included that there for you. So again, here is a screenshot in the Chrome job type for schedule report bundles. You would just send output to file. This is where you would enter that those email addresses here for yourself. So again, Miller would be your name. And this is just an example and then your password. Four zero nine eight census report, um, including life insurance amount twice. There was a bug where um, when they were running the census report, if an employee had life insurance premium paid included in the payroll, then the amount of the life insurance paid amount is included twice for a salary column. Um, the life insurance amount is added to the federal historical pay item gross um, at the time of the payroll is posted, and then the report adds it to the salary amount again. So this was wrong. So this updated the report service to not add the life insurance premium amount um, since it's already been added to the historical pay item gross. So that's been corrected. On the 6.23 release on September 25th, we had a non-5367, a non-contract mass load extract um, to add the type and name fields. So when you're doing a mass load for non-contract mass load, um, also add employee, they added the employee's first last name to make things a little easier. And again, this is under the home SSD non-contract compensation mass load extract. So again, you can see that the type would be the non-contract that it changed for, and now it's the position employee name, last name, and the position employee name, first name. So those two are required for mass loading. <clears throat> Another one on the 6.23 was 5366, which is the benefit accrual service, um, including archived employees in the accrual. Um, archive employees should no longer be included in any of the benefit update and production projection outputs. There was a request um, that these no longer be included. So now they will only look at any non archive employees for processing. So if you do want those employees to show, um, then you would need to on archive them to include those on those benefit accruals. For the 5012, payrolls do not get as get set up as process and HGH submission when the close posting period is closed. So again, um, here's a screenshot. If they want these ACH files generated to turn to true so they know that they submitted them, they got to make sure that their pay date matches their posting period open. So again, for the historical payments to turn from false to true, you need your posting periods to, to, need be, to be open which probably a lot of districts do have that open um, when they're running their ACH files before they um, close it out and open their new month. But um, again, now that is updated. So now when they do that, this is turned to true and they can tell that those have been submitted. 4858 refund of payroll item shows at zero on the employee direct deposit or check. Um, before there was a bug where any error adjustments that were added to the refund money through payroll, um, the adjustment shows on the check direct deposit, but it was showing as zero. So now they actually show as negatives. So if you do an error adjustment, they're gonna show on the pay stubs as negatives and not zeros anymore. On the 4622 um, benefit obligation and wage obligation, um, they were not restricted by permissions. So uh, we had some roles added for legacy roles, the wage obligation reports for the employee and account, both of those reports. Um, the employee will need USB standard wage obligation report granted. And they also must have the USB standard employee view. And then also for the benefit obligation reports, both employee and accounts for legacy roles, um, needs USB standard benefit obligation 
and also the employee view in order to run these reports. And again, um, if you have questions, um, there is a actual printout for those uh, menu permissions. Um, so you can go and go to the role under menu permission and then you can actually um, download this and you can see all the roles, what you need for each one. If you're unaware that was out there, that is there. <clears throat> for the 6.23.1, and this was on October 5th, for 5409, we have a Medicare tax over 200,000 does not calculate it, import it, pick up amounts properly. So this has been corrected. On the 6.24 on October 6, uh, 5414, compensation on employee grid is no longer defaulted as archived. Um, before, when um, districts or anybody went to the employee dashboard and went to compensations, um, this they automatically this was checked as to include to um, archive uh, compensations, and so now this no longer is defaulted as archived. On the 6.24, we have 5210, the bud budget distribution, pay account distribution reports. Um, what added an error so the districts can see who their problem was. Before, there was no detail. Um, it just errored out, and then they had no clue who was the issue, what position. Um, so this was now updated on the 5210, so now they should get a, server, a severe error. And then it actually will tell um, what the error is and the employee and the position number. Four, four, five, 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 W2 error report. Um, the users would like to see the warnings and errors together um, before it was just error showing on the W2 error report. And now it will be both. So if employee had both a warning and an error, it's gonna show both now. For the 4003, the W2 report, um, they wanted to add a selection criteria option to the first page of the report so they could see what they were actually running if they wanted to double check how they ran it. So now this has all been added. So things that were missing were the pay group, employee section, and the pay items for box 14. That, that was not getting printed on here. And now those have been added here at the bottom. For the 6.241 release on October 13th, the 5421 um, add primary flag to the compensation object. Um, as you can see over um, the past couple of months, we've been adding um, that new primary flag. So now they can, if districts want to use this, they can check it to say that that is their primary um, compensation. And that has been added to um, mostly, um, I think, position compensation. So the, the primary compensation can be reported through the custom report we created, creator anywhere the position can be reported, and also in the mass load documentation. So again, we added this to the mass load, and now it's called primary compensation. So again, if they're wanting to just bring in the employee's primary compensation, if they do have those all marked, they can actually bring that in um, for those and only um, show those on that report. The next one would be our 6.25, and that was on October 20th. 5412, you wanna add a permission listing report to USPS. So now under the SSD USB role listing under the home option, now we have a new report out there, it's called USB role listing. And we have a query options. When you go to that, you can include the following roles. So what you would type in the roles that you're looking for, for your district. And then you wanna make sure they're separated by a comma with no space. So you can bring in several different ones if you like, just make sure they're separated by a comma with no space. And then here's an example of the report. So now you can show administrators, you can show group managers what that all permission entails and the parent. On 5309, um, this was added now, um, which we had on the calendar meeting, 
um, IT one would like the districts to submit their um, own W-2. So if that's an option that you're um, with your ITC, um, new configuration setup for W-2 submission for the districts. And that was under W-2, sorry, W-2 configuration. And that is districts would submit own W-2 files. So this is where that option would be now. So for 5309, just to continue, it's just to show that once you do click on, click on that, um, under W-2 report, you're going to see these W-2 options for C SSA, CCA, and RITA. And then under W-2 city options, you will see the new field box now tax entity code and then your submission file report and submission file. And then under W-2 state, now you will see um, all the surrounding states plus um, the boxes that are now showing once that is selected and the create the different files once those are selected. For 5302 Deputy reporting, um, need a way to show sick leave paid for Corona. So under system rules, we added a new rule that if a error percent, uh, it's very prevent federal COVID-19 amounts for exceeding the max. Um, so if you, it, it is enabled once it was in the release. So every district um, will when they run it and if they have something that's over the max amount that is required by the federal for these fields, they will get an error for each one. So they won't be able to put anything over the max amount and then have issues um, during W-2 time because of that. So I think this is a, a pretty good error to leave out there. So that is caught during W-2 um, processing. Um, again, this is just a, a, um, uh, the screenshot of if the rule is checked and district is adding amounts over the max amount. So this is the errors that they will get if that's enabled. Emergency family cannot exceed over the 10,000. The COVID-19 for other amounts would be over the 2,000. And then they would see self amount cannot exceed the 5110. So that's what the errors will look like if that is over the amount. And a little bit more on this, um, it was added under the 001 federal payroll item for each employee. They will now see this at the bottom. It's at the bottom more of the 001, their record, federal. And you'll see, and this is where they would add these amounts in for those employees. And then also um, these kind of COVID-19 leave types are available also um, I added that in here for six for the employee self. It's 511 per day, and that's a max of 511.10. And then for the others, it's 200 per day limit with a max of 2,000. And then for the family qualifications, that would be if the daycares are closed or unavailable, um, be 10 weeks paid leave, which is two thirds of the pay. Max is on, is 10,000. Um, if wanting to change the field names, this can be done also using this under systems, custom field definitions. Um, if your districts don't like how that is showing um, here on the 001 record, if they want that to be a little different, they can change those by going here and doing an edit and just changing them to what they actually want to show those field names to be. That is an option. Um, so now the COVID-19 um, amounts will show on box 14 of the employee's W-2. Um, and again, um, if the employee has a vehicle lease entered, this amount will always show first. And then any two COVID amounts if entered. Um, the order of the box of uh, 14 items, how it will show and how it will decide what will show, um, it will always be the vehicle first if that's entered. And then any one of these, if they're entered, and then any fringe benefits, and then any payroll items selected after that. 
And again, only the top three will always print. So you can add, um, you can add up to six when you're running W2 proc, but only those first three will always show. Okay. So again, here is an example of the W2 report for sick leave. So again, this is how it's gonna show on the W2. So it's gonna be COVID self, COVID others, and COVID emergency. That's how it's gonna show when they um, print the W2, if they had all three, which you probably won't have all three, but that's how it will show. And then down at the employee type summary, um, again, under the report summary and under the employee type summary, you're gonna see exactly um, the same thing, but just the total for all the employees. Um, again, if you have many employees in your districts that have are out because of COVID, we do have that option to do mass loading and that has been added now. So if you go to mass loading under um, payroll items, um, we do have that in there and these are the fields you would need to use plus um, the ones that are actually near like employee ID probably is one, but these are what the names of those fields are now. So again, I included the wiki um, URL that takes you directly to this mass load. Um, if you're using the custom report creator, um, you wanna make sure that you use the payroll account object when you're selecting because we do have two, we have payroll accounts with the S at the end and payroll account. And you wanna make sure you use the payroll account object if you're creating a report to um, pull in employees that you need to change. Um, you just wanna make sure that, that you, you select the correct object because that will make a difference. For the 3952, um, W-2 reporting, um, this is, was include payroll item adjustment journals when not paid during the year. So the W-2 reporting selection involves finding all the employees, payroll item configuration pairs that were paid during the year. And then it looks up any related adjustment journals and includes them. So again, if the payroll item consumption was never paid during the year, um, any associated adjustment journals were not be included. So this is what this corrected. So what they did behind the scene was added a separate query to find all adjustment journals for any employees and then add the payroll item configuration if it was not ready included. So that was fixed. On to the 6.26, which is the November 6 release. This was the creation of W-2 submission files for the surrounding state file, states of Ohio. And I just included um, each juror issue if you wanted to look at each. Um, we did include those all on the calendar year end meeting. So now if you have um, employees for Pennsylvania, for Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, and West Virginia, and then now we have a separate file that was also created for the Ohio submission. So again, here's a screenshot of how this looks now. So now you have all your surrounding states plus Ohio and underneath the W-2 state op options. So once you click on each one differently, down here at the bottom, we'll say generate Pennsylvania, generate West Virginia. And you have to enter in anything in red, make sure those are entered. And again, anything with the red asterisk, those are required fields. On the 5400 districts W-2 um, processing, create W-2 submission file summary report. Um, if you remember, if you were the ones that were creating um, the W-2 uh, tape file for your districts, um, you will see that there was a W-2 tape that text that was always created in Classic. And they wanted a report that was similar to that so they can print that off. So now they do have, uh, it's called uh, W2 tape. So each one will now show a, the similar report exactly like this. And it's just called a file summary report. So 
So down here at the bottom, you will see generate SSA W2 submission files. So if the districts, you have that checked on the configuration as district will submit, these will now pop up underneath your W2 report and W2 city. And under the W2 state options. So you see the W2 Ohio submission file. And then this is an example of what the W2 submission files will look like. So it will just show how many is processed, the FICA wages, the wages, and pretty much exactly. It just may look a little different than what the classic was, but it has the same information. Under the 5446, the outstanding payables, payables adjustment added position number. You have the SERS code 400, position eight. So now you see before when you went into your outstanding payables and you went to the payables ledger for the adjustments, you could see the employee when you brought up employee that had um, positions attached to different um, payroll items you couldn't tell that they just had a list of a bunch of different um, the same codes, but you didn't know which was what. So they might have two four hundreds or two five nineties, but you didn't know which was which. And now that has been added. So when you go in there, you will see that difference now. So fifty four twenty seven employee dashboard compensations now shows all compensations. So you include the archive box is now unchecked. Um, as you can see now, you might notice a little difference when you're going into the um, reports. Uh, the save and recall options have been added or slowly being added to each report now. So now you have that option to save your reports of exactly how you have them set up so you don't have to always select different all your different options. And then you can name it um, exactly what you want. So now it's under the SERS monthly and the SERS surcharge. On the 6.27, then November 20th, the 5489, the employer distribution does not handle employer level retirement properly in all cases. Um, so when the employer level position item is charged and other payroll items exist for that same retirement system at the position level, um, there's a bug where the employer level item does not include those positions in the gross when they were processing the payroll. So now the employer distribution will have those. On the 5485, the employer master report, um, they fixed the MPE error on the gender filter. So if an employee has a null value in the gender custom field for an employee, um, when they ran the employee master report is filtered by the gender, um, there was an MPE error was received. So what they wanted to do was take the error off. So now if the gender was left blank on the employee screen and they ran the master report, um, it will still complete with no errors. It just won't show that employee. It, was, it wasn't liking that that was, um, didn't have anything in there before. So now it will complete with no errors. For the 5479, um, add a new total hours worked and under the custom report creator. So now there's new two new properties um, under the historical employee pay. There is the total hours worked and this would be all the hours work from all pay amounts for this employee added together. So if you were had a district that was wanting to see these, these are now out there. And then under the historical position pay, a total position hours worked has been added. And this is all the hours worked from all pay amounts for the position total. And again, when you're in those um, under the historical employee and position, you have to scroll down probably way at the bottom um, and that's where it has been added. On the 5477, a ZID not assigned in, in specific situations, we're having issues where um, if how a ZID was being added in redesign, um, and it was supposed to be where when you're running the collection, it was supposed to create one and then add it 
in the credential ID area for that employee then in redesign, and it wasn't doing that. So now that has been fixed. And so when they run the collection is performed, the ZID will auto assign to that employee now. On the 5473, add default dates to the SSD account history template reports. So the SSD account history template report will now default the start and stop query dates to he and a T. So that stands for posting period start date and today. So what would, why they did this was to try to prevent the user from running it without any dates. So now they have to go in there, either leave it as is, or they have to go in there and actually change it to the dates they want it to run. And this was a request that that was asked to be added. On the 5464, the EMIS reporting changes for fiscal year 2021. Um, again, they removed the position code 509 no longer is there. And then the HQPD element from the reporting requirements is no longer there. And they also removed a six hour late teacher under state reporting appointment type. So that was done on the 5464 release, their issue. On the 5429, the W-2 form and XML file show three positions after the decimal point for vehicle lease. Um, there was a request to change that since Classic was showing two, but the, um, and that was showing it off if they were um, doing side-by-side -side comparison. Um, and now that is two decimal points. And you, you can see on the W-2, it's now two on the XML. And then here's just a, uh, the W-2 report. Again, on the 6.27, we had save and recall options added for the wage obligation by employee, by account, and then again on the employee master report. So again, the save and recall options, and again, allows users to create and save certain reports um, for different report runs for each option. So they can have multiple um, different ways they run it and save it under different names. For 49.40, Users want to mass load by distributions. They want to add new mass load option, pay distributions. And then I included the wiki for the mass load if you had any questions on that. Um, again, if the employee fails for one transaction, um, they will fail for all transactions for that employee. So, and it probably will give them the same error even though it might be just one, one line for that employee that was wrong, but it's going to stop it for all, for all of the employee. And not for all the employees, just the one that actually had the one error in it. So, but if you had three or four lines for that one employee, it's going to actually um, error out and give you an error on each line. And then you have to correct um, the one that's wrong and then resubmit it for that employee. For the 6.28, uh, 5183 and 5190, these were employee earning registers and the payment transaction status report. On the 5094, ODS report looks at legal name on the employee screen first. If no legal name is entered, it will then use the name field. So again, for ODGFS, um, it was not looking at the legal name and they wanted that to look at that first if there was anything entered and then it will look, if nothing there, it will look at the name field. On 5405, OGFS new hire report, you want to use the employee hire date if no ODFGF hire date is um, supplied. And then on the 5491, um, remove the unused properties from the payee. So under the customer report recreator under payee, um, no longer is there a pay item listed. So that was removed. On the 5480, the overtime rounding, um, the classic was rounding the overtime rate to two decimals and redo design was rounding to three places and this was causing an issue. So now it will round to just two. And again, that's under the edit rounding configuration for overtime. And it's in the unit amount decimal positions. 
this is where that would be located. So if you have two there, now it will actually look in B2 and it will up it from 0.25 to 0.03. On the 5483, the users would like the option to archive positions. So now when you're going into your position screen, you will see that it still shows that an X and it still says, are you sure you want to delete? But if you hover over it, it, it does say archive. And then now you have the option to include our um, archive or not in positions. So now you can hide those if you no longer want to see those old positions for those employees. Okay, well, I guess that's all I have for now. Um, actually, the 6.28, I'm a little jump the gun because I don't believe that's out yet, but I just wanted to share you that's what's coming up on the 6.28. I just thought of that after I was saying that, but I just wanted to let you know that is what's coming out for the 6.28. I believe that's probably maybe next Friday. Um, just want to let you know that is what's coming out. So um, is there any questions on any of these that you want to go over before we take a, a probably a five minute break before we get into the USAS? Andrea, there's a chat question. <clears throat> okay, can you read that for me? Because I can't see it. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, question on COVID. I see the fields on the 001, but not a choice under adjustment. Sorry if I missed it. Uh, when will those be added to adjustments? Uh, they will not be added to the adjustments. That is we're only under, under mass load and under because since they're added in the COVID, uh, or since they're added under the payroll item for 001, that's where you would go ahead and make those entries. Um, they won't be added under the adjustments. Because that's kind of the adjustment for the employee, which is under the 001 federal record. Because those other ones that you see in adjustments, you don't see on the federal record like you used to in classic. So, but it, but for the COVID amounts, you actually do see them. So that's where you would go ahead and make any adjustments or adding any of those for your employee. Just trying to find that. Um, yeah, right here. So that's where, that would be your adjustment. It's not under the actual adjustment under core, it's under the actual payroll item federal for that employee. That was a good question, thank you. Is there any other questions on that? Okay, well, I thank you very much for joining me this morning for the payroll side of things. Um, again, we do have that out on our um, wiki page under the training. So again, if you will go out here, we do have those out here. So if you want to just copy those and go over those, or if somebody couldn't make it, we do have those out there for you. Okay, Pat, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Do you want to do a five minute break? Yeah, you guys want to take a break? I have 944, so at 950, we'll come back. Okay, now go ahead and pause recording for now. So I'll be going over uh, the USAS major updates from recent releases. The last time we reviewed the major updates was in August. So today we're gonna, I'm gonna review the updates from that point in time through today. So those are the releases of 8.1 through 8.9, which is the one that's scheduled for today. You can find more details on the release notes by going to the wiki page under state software redesign. And these are the USAS release notes. Those are the USPS release notes. And then you can click for more detail if you're wondering about something. Um, also, I wanted to show you um, what she showed you. Our PowerPoints are listed here. After today, the recording will be linked here. So you can 
watch it again, or if you have people that missed it, you're welcome to watch it afterwards. Um, and remember, if you're thinking of a question, somebody else is too, so don't be shy. Speak up or submit a question through chat and we'll try to answer it today. If not, we'll get back with you. So first we're gonna talk about the changes in the software that mainly were from the state, such as the Auditor of State or ODE. If you recall in July on the 7.46 release, the 510 fund was added as the coronavirus fund, and it was like two words. And since then they changed it in, um, to be the coronavirus relief fund. So this was changed in the 8.8 .8 release in November. So now if you add this fund and let the system default to the account name, it will be this as it populates. Also, when some of these new funds were added in the software, it was noticed on the appropriation resolution report that some of these funds were not capital letters like all the other funds. Therefore, we corrected this in October on the 8.5 release and had all funds default to the format of capital letters for consist consistency. ODE also updated subject codes for the fiscal year 2021, which can be found in the ODE EMIS manual, the section 4.7. And the EMIS manual is what SSDT used to update these subject codes in the redesign on the 8.5 release in October. And then the state treasurer's office made changes to the Ohio checkbook program. So on the 8.2 release, what was once called the online checkbook extract is now renamed to be called the ohiocheckbook.gov and then the, the extract file name is now ohiocheckbook.csv. Also on the 5. Point, or 8.5 release, the Ohio Checkbook Gov extract was improved to handle the vendor names with special characters. Um, the one that I can think of is the store at home. Um, so if that was the vendor, it was previously removing those special characters like that at sign at home. So now it'll include that since that is part of the vendor's name. <clears throat> the 8.1 release limited the number of characters included on the cash account description on the gap extract. This way it complies with the web gap application import. So now it will only include the first 50 characters of the account description. And we also made changes to the five-year forecast in November on the 8.7 release. The EMIS manual reflected that this line number of the five-year forecast included object codes of the account structure to be objects 810 through 819. However, this was different than the way Classic calculated it. Therefore, SSDT received clarification from the Auditor of State who received clarification from ODE stating that that line number on the five-year forecast should be calculated like in Classic which is different than the EMIS manual. The way it's working in classic and the way it's gonna work in the redesign after the 8.7 release in November will be it will only include object code 810 and 811. So as you know, we advised that districts, if they had submitted their five-year forecast ahead of time or prior to that release that we recommended um, reviewing the forecast and resubmitting it if 4.01 line number was involved. Oops, sorry. I guess I was ready to go. Also since August, we have some new reports. As of the 8.6 release, four new template reports are available. The SSTT USAS role listing, 
the appropriation history report, which is like the classic software's app his report. The budget history report, which is like classics bud his and the revenue account history report, which mimics the rev his report in classic. So I'm going to go into the software and show you these reports. I already have them saved as a favorite on my homepage. So the SST T user listing report will provide you a listing of the USAS roles as well as the permissions they grant. And you can run this report by excluding roles if you choose to. And then this enable true or false would show depending on that answer would show the permission. So once you generate that report, you would see your, your roles and your permissions on the report. And if you answer that question the opposite way, your report will just show the username and the name of the employee. Another new report was the appropriation history report, which is like the APHIS. The user can select the fund or the cash account. And once that is generated, you will see a report that um, shows the uh, appropriation accounts, the current fiscal year to date expendable, the actual expended in the last three years, or the, yeah, the last three years expenditures for the, those accounts. The other report is the budget history, and that represents classics bud his report and again when you run that report you can select the fund or the cash account and this will produce a report showing the budget accounts and fiscal year to date expendable expended in the last pri three prior years so similarly the revenue account history report can also be run the same way. And when that is generated, you will see the revenue accounts with the fiscal year to date receivable, the actual received and total receipts by the revenue account for each of the three prior years. So those can be helpful. Some random or miscellaneous updates included the release in October 8.5, which improved the handling of the phone numbers when dots or periods are used instead of the traditional dashes. And in September on the 8.3 release, a problem was corrected and a more user-friendly error message was created when the user would change the void date or if the date happens to be empty. Because as you know, the redesign does not like empty fields. So transactions posted by third party vendor applications and the SOAP service caused some problems that impacted data, but they were addressed on the 8.3 release in September. These included correcting a problem that allowed the third party software to post an invoice on a canceled purchase order, which as you know, redesign does not allow you to post an invoice on a canceled purchase order. And that's what caused the error. We also corrected a problem when converting a split item purchase order to make sure the quantity is set properly. The third party application was actually setting it to an empty field. And again, the redesign doesn't like 
empty or null fields. The requisition headers, item descriptions, and the PO deliver to address fields were limited, were, I'm sorry, were updated to allow larger, uh, larger values. And we also corrected a bug that prevented districts from printing with customized requisition documents. The 8.4 release in September corrected the XML print file on a purchase order with the split price items. <clears throat> And the 8.7 release in November corrected a problem in the requisition converter in the SOAP bridge. The redesign does not require an account code on a requisition. However, that SOAP bridge was not converting the requisitions that were from the third party softwares when those items in the third party software requisition didn't have an account code. So the requisition requisition converter in the SOAP bridge wasn't converting it um, and bringing it over to the redesign. So that's been corrected. So now when a requisition charge is gonna be created, even if that account um, doesn't exist. And this can be seen when the user prints a requisition that doesn't have an account selected, it would show no account selected on the PDF rec. And then recently in November on the 8.8 .8 release, we corrected a problem on that soap bridge that caused problems for the third party vendor attempting to retrieve the purchase orders that have an item with a quantity of zero. Account change updates since August included the 8.1 release in August that corrected um, or that corrected the process to also update the void disbursement items. Previously, the account change process was not updating these. It, so we also included a patch to update any void disbursements related to that account if account change had been processed. On the 8.2 release, we improved the account change process to only allow one account change to be processed at a time. When more than one process was running before this release, the account change process look, goes out there and looks at, um, or actually processes the opening and closing of the posting periods to update the transactions in the account change. So sometimes these multiple account changes interfered with each other and then caused one to fail. So that was a nice update. So now if an account change is in progress, another one cannot be started until it completes. And it'll give you like a little message that one is currently in process. So I like that feature. The developers also refactored the handling of posting periods to improve the performance of the count change job as well. And on the 8.3 release in September, a bug with the account change was corrected to make sure all the payables were also included when the process is run. And this was discovered when a purchase order was posted and invoiced like in a prior fiscal year, and then an account change was processed, and then the disbursement was created. So somehow the encumbrances stayed tied to the old account in error, and this was fixed. In August, on the 8.2 release, we corrected a bug that allowed the posting of initial budget transactions on the expenditure account, even if uh, initial amount already existed. So the old process before this release checked for the posting period for initial transactions. And now with this release, the system's gonna go out there and check for initial transactions for the fiscal year. Rather than looking at the posting period, it's gonna look for the if there's any initial amounts for the whole fiscal year.
some imp uh, performance improvements since August included the revenue and expenditure report, which was improved by 98% on the 8.1 release. And the performance improvement was made when posting purchase orders as well. And that was on the 8.6 release. So the new accounts receivable module on the 8.0 release in August, um, there were some corrections that came after the original um, accounts receivable release. And as I said before, the redesign doesn't like empty or null fields. And on the 8.1 release, the developers corrected a problem with the AR customer import that caused the import to actually fail because there was an empty value somewhere in the address. So we corrected that, that it wouldn't just totally fail. And on the 8.7 release, we corrected problems with the receipt reversal option and properly secured the ability to process this. Prior to this release, this option to reverse a receipt was not actually gave read-only users access, and that wasn't right. So now with, this, with the 8.7 release, the USAS underscore receipt underscore create permission was created, and it is required in order to post a reverse receipt. And this permission is included in the standard USAS role. Secondly, in that release, if an error was generated when processing the reversal, it looked to the user like the process failed, but in fact, the reverse receipt actually been created. So both those issues were created. And as you know, with any new software, you're gonna have a bug because you can't necessarily test every single part because there's so many scenarios. So I am going to go into the software, but first I'm going to show you um, this. I'm going to show you this in the software, but never mind. I'm just going to go to the software. Sorry. So we also implemented the filtering of customers and ledger codes to allow users to easily search for customer or ledger codes with a drop down. So when they're creating a billing and going in here, the drop down is now available for both the customer and the ledger codes. So I included some of those screenshots on the PowerPoint, but I'm also going to show you some of the um, like tips. So you can start filtering them by the number. One oh oh eight, and it'll pull it up. You can start by with like I entered Z and it pulled up Zoology Booster Club. But the other nice thing is if this one has Sunny Pathway BOW, if you don't know what it is, but and that's similar, but you know you're looking for the one that's a school, you can use the wild card of the parentheses and start typing school and it'll bring you up every customer name with the um, Word school. So it's this particular sunny pathway. And that's how you can find it. Instead of 1009, the school is 1006. So hopefully that's useful. On the 8.8 .8 release, we improved the creation of the receipt when processing, processing the AR payments. And the improvement was to populate who it was received from. 
so now the billing customer actually gets pulled into um, the billing customer shows on the receipt too. So if we went looking at that billing or that payment, if you go to the receipts, that this customer name of transportation company on the billing is now pulled in to be where it's received from. And that was requested by several people. So that should be a nice enhancement as well. So I included those screenshots in the PowerPoint in case you wanted to refer back to or use it for training. And that's where it shows where the AR payment customer pulls into the receipt, receive from field. And as you know, that we had new 10, 1099 features, um, the ability for districts to create their own IRS fire system, their 1099 submission file. And this started being implemented with the 8.4 release. Um, the reminder that districts that plan on submitting their own file would need to obtain that transmitter control code. And then that would be entered under the IRS configuration under the system menu in the redesign. And once that's been done, the user's menu options also change. And this is included both in the calendar year end um, webinar that's on the ITC training and registration page, as well as in the documentation. Oh, and I provided the link here for easy access. On the 8.7 release in November, the developers implemented the changes to the forms. So because the new form 1099 NEC was created, the miscellaneous form also changed. So using the IRS publication 1220, the developers implemented those. So today's release will be 8.9. And these are the items that are planned. And if they are not on this release, which I'm pretty sure they will be, um, they will be on the next one. So the items that were planned were any updates on the SSDT file submission for the 1099s. If the state gave us any um, changes to be made to that file, then we would make changes to the redesigned software. The IRS configuration set up for districts to submit their own data was not previously accessible to anyone with the USAS manager role. So that should be, that will be included on the release. So now anybody with the USAS manager role will be able to set up the district to submit their own rather than having the ITC having to do that for everybody. Also, after the year end or the calendar year end meeting on November 13th, we discovered that the combined federal state filing checkbox doesn't apply to the 1099 NEC form. So that will be addressed in the upcoming releases as well. And not in today's release, but um, coming soon, the calendar year and archive report bundle is being created. And you'll find this under the utility menu going under utility file archive. And then it'll be positioned right next to the um, other archive tabs. So the calendar year end bundle of reports will be sent to this new calendar year end archive tab instead of how it was previously sent to the December's monthly archive tab. And the, um, 
They'll include the calendar year end reports. It'll include the copies of the 1099 submission files, and it will include the XML print files. So this may be a convenient way for the ITCs to grab the redesigned district 1099 files to print. The ITC can go out to that calendar year end archive tab in order to get the 1099 file to print the district's 1099s. So just thinking ahead, if you're doing that, a suggestion might be to add that to the uh, calendar year end checklist for the district so that the district can verify that all these items are actually in the file archive so that it saves the ITC some time when you're ready to print. And last but not least, the developers are still working on the ability to merge vendors. We plan to make this feature available by the end of the year in case anyone needs to merge any vendors for 1099 processing. And really that's all I have today, but I wanted to remind you of next week's Fridays with Fiscal which includes customizing a template form file. So that should be interesting and it starts at 9 a.m. The link is attached to the PowerPoint, but you can also find it on the ITC training page from the wiki. I did not see any questions in the chat, but if anybody has anything to share or ask, feel free to do so. I just have a comment to make. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I did send out an email earlier this morning regarding uh, W-2 um, information, regarding other state submissions, and regarding the combined federal um, state combined reporting. So I sent that out through SSDT notices just to give you guys a heads up. Just some more clarification, questions that um, ITC's had, and so we thought we would share it with the rest of you to make sure that um, everyone's on the same page. So if you have any questions about that email, just respond back to me and um, we'll take care of that. You know, this is an ongoing process with W-2 and 1099 changes this year, so things keep popping up and stuff. So, you know, we're just trying to head off some of these questions so that um, everyone's fully prepared for um, the season. Um, so, um, so like I said, if you have any questions about that, um, let us know. Um, other than that, I'll just turn it back to Pat. You guys have a good weekend. And I don't have anything else. If everybody else don't, does not have any questions, I hope you guys all stay safe and healthy. And we'll see you next time. Have a great weekend. Thank you.